Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I'm here today with a preview of Rising Waters. This is a game that has come to Kickstarter from Central Michigan University's Center for Learning Through Games and Simulations, and it is designed by Professor Scout Blum. The overall mission of CMU is to create games that both play well as games and that are peer-reviewed by actual historians, so these games are both academically sound and playable by everyone from students to hobby gamers to even other scholars trying to check out each other's work. I should mention that this is a preview, but is in no way an objective preview because I have both financial and personal relationships with Central Michigan University. They sponsor my podcast, which I am deeply grateful for. I'm personal friends with basically everybody involved with this game, and I really want to see the CLGS make it because to me, classroom games are very important, and I want to see more gaming pedagogy happening in the United States and around the world. So I'm here to show off this game, but I'm definitely not here to review it. I will also say that this is a prototype board and that some of the rules of this game are still in development. Basically, this game has been under development for a couple of years now. This was originally a Zenobia entrant that made the top 12. Then Central Michigan University picked it up. It's continued to be under development and it's now with other developers who are helping to refine the game and ensure that some of the cultural consultant suggestions make it into the game successfully and other stuff. So the heart of this game is already done. But this video is really more about showing you what's in the game, how it's roughly going to flow, than it is about technical rules. So if you're coming to this video and the game is already out, there have probably been some changes since that time. And hopefully at that point I'll be making another video. So what is the premise of this game? Rising Waters is a game that looks at the Mississippi flood of 1927, uh, which was a major national disaster in American history. And it does so through the lens of the African American plight. You and your fellow players are sharecroppers who are trying to preserve your home, your communities, everything that you have against these rising floodwaters. Meanwhile, the landowners that you work for in an exploitative situation are simultaneously kind of helping you, but not in really the way that you would deserve, and threatening and bullying you into doing what they want because they only care about themselves. Meanwhile, you are doing everything that you can with your resources, so your land, your family, your education, your culture, in order to hold strong and rebuild what you've lost and preserve what you've got. The game it takes place over a number of weeks, so the idea is to survive to a certain week threshold, um, and you're trying to do that without taking a certain number of losses, and the number of losses that you are able to take scales depending on the number of players that there are and the difficulty of the game. So the version of the game that I am planning to show you in this video is actually the easier version of the game, kind of the intro level, and that is the fall 1926 version of the game. The spring 1927 version of the game is really the fancier, more difficult, really flagship version of Rising Waters, but because some things are in flux and I want to show you the most streamlined possible game, I'm going with 1926. So the 1926 version of the game, you play to seven weeks. The water level starts at one, which is going to be really significant. It starts at two in 1927. And with two players, I could go up to 20 losses for a two player game. And losses are gonna come pretty fast. So that gives me some time to kind of work with as I work to survive. The 1926 version of the game also has a slightly nicer landowner's deck. So some of the more negative cards have been taken out. They're just, they're, there are some that have been totally eliminated from the game. And there are also fewer of the really bad ones in here. And then we also have weather reports, which we're gonna talk about. And again, the nastiest weather reports have been reduced in this deck, and in the full version of the game in 1927, you play with some really rough ones. This is also the more streamlined version of the game in the sense that in the 1927 version, you've got a lot of replayability because there are a lot of different things you're going to be able to add in. So this is the absolute simplest setup, but there will be setups that have survivors who you can try to rescue, uh, a raft to try to rescue them with. You can play with or without individual player powers, and you can play with or without community goals. So the game also comes with community goals that you can try to fulfill, different ones each game. So again, you get some variability. And you're essentially donating some of your cards, which you're going to need for a number of other purposes, in order to meet community goals, help everyone around you, and that can actually help you reduce losses in the game and kind of buoy yourself up as you work to survive, representing the power of your community. 
1927 version of the game is also going to have relief camps. And depending on how much you've donated to your community, those relief camps can either be green and in your favor, so they become safe havens for you, or they can be red, which means that they're formed by the landowners. And so they're kind of helpful, but they're also deeply evil. In fact, they represent landowners using human bodies to build up levees in this area during this crisis. So as you can probably see, mechanically, all the things that exist in the game have a basis in historical reality. And the game is meant to really simulate some of the challenges that the sharecroppers in this area were facing during a historically terrible national disaster. So think watery, pandemic inspired with a historical setting, and you pretty much got an idea for what Rising Waters is about. So that said, I've mostly set this game up. I want to finish set up and then I want to play through a round of this game very carefully so that you can get a sense of how it plays and the steps involved in each turn. And hopefully that'll give you a good sense of whether this is a game that you want to back, whether it's for you. The box does say two to four players, but it's a cooperative game, so I'm going to be two-handing it. So this is basically the setup for a two-player game. Basically, the way that setup works is you want to set up your initial towns, and then there's an extra town that you kind of want to come and protect in a two-player game. And I get to also set up some initial levies. So what's going on here is that you'll see a lot of these hex groups have numbers on them. In fact, all the land ones do, and then the water ones will change in ways that I'll be able to show you. But essentially, the level of the land determines whether these areas are going to flood very easily or not. So you want to build levees. You want to make sure that you put your towns in places that have a high elevation because you don't want to put yourself in a situation where you are suffering huge losses in the first turn because your town got flooded on the second weather card. So take it from me. You want to be paying good attention to the levees and to shoring up these areas that are of lower elevation. I've also got my player boards set up and we're going to talk about these when we talk about player actions because they are pretty cool. And then over here, we've got our landowner cards that we have to deal with. So basically the community cards belong to us and the landowner cards are cards that come from the landowners we have to cope with as we cope with a crisis as well. These pawns are survivors, which are not used in the 1926 version of the game, but I just had them out and we'll leave them there. So before we deal with this landowner issuing a threat, the first thing I, I need to do is do the weather reports. And this is something that I thought that we should do together because probably the most complicated part of this game is the way the water rules work. So basically as things flood, we have water elevation that takes place in a certain way, in a certain order, um, and affects certain pieces of land in an order that works fine once you understand it, but it takes a little bit of explaining. So let's have our first weather report. So fortunately, we just got some light rain here in the Tensaw Basin. So basically there are little dots that indicate locations. So we've got Mounds Landing, the Yazoo Valley, which affects all lakes, Cabin Teal, and Tensaw Basin. And then here we have Vicksburg down here as like a town. But basically what's gonna happen is the Tensaw Basin goes to plus one on the water. So this started at an elevation of one uh, because we are playing the 1926 version of the game. If we were playing 1927, it would already be two and we would already be having a flood and some losses because this one is about to become a two. So this entire water hex group has become a two. And once that happens, basically what you do is you look at the water level, you check clockwise to kind of see if any of the land is at a lower elevation than two, in which case the water is going to flow onto that land. And if not, then guess what? You can relax. Nothing happened this time. So fortunately, we're okay because this first land that this, this particular group surrounded by the white line touches is at three, three. Good thing I put a levy there for the future. Haha. <laughs> and these twos and then another three are all safe. So basically we went all the way around the clock of the Tensaw Basin. And we know that nothing went wrong this time. Huh. All right, so that's a weather report. We're going to draw two more of these before we start. All right, so now we've got a medium rain in Mounds Landing. That's tough because that adds two to the elevation. So now we are at three. So we put three right there in that dot. And that affects this little group of hexes that are touching these bits of land. So again, what we're going to do is we're going to start at due north and we're going to move clockwise around. So the four is fine. The two is not fine. So what will happen is we are going to flood it. So unfortunately we flooded that land, but because we flooded the land, then the water will kind of settle down to two. However, because some land was flooded, we already took our first loss. Every hex group that you lose 
counts as a loss. Um, when you lose pawns and towns, that's a loss. There are a lot of things that can happen to cause some loss in this game. So that was the medium rain up in Mounds Landing. And then now we have light rain in the Yazoo Valley. So now the Yazoo Valley is going to be up to two. But fortunately, just a quick look around, we know that nothing is lower than two, so we're okay for now. And then as we draw more of these cards, we are gonna be placing tokens kind of moving downstream in order to represent the water flooding different areas of the map. All right, so let's go ahead and play through a round of this game. It's gonna take place in five phases. So basically we're going to upgrade our player abilities, which I'll talk about. We're gonna replenish and resolve landowner cards, which means we're gonna have to deal with this threat over here. We do get to work cooperatively though. Then we get player actions. And so I'll walk you through the player actions. We'll reveal and resolve weather report cards. So there's always a weather report, oh dear. And then we will just do cleanup. So those are the five phases of the turn and we're gonna go through them one by one and I'm gonna kind of give you a deeper look at the components of the game while we go. So the first thing we're gonna do is upgrade player abilities. So how would that work? Let me show you by zooming in on one of our player sheets. So one thing I liked quite a bit about this game is it allows you to upgrade your powers as you go. So there are two kinds of powers in Rising Waters. There are permanent powers, which means you can permanently upgrade how many actions per turn you can take, how much movement you can do. You can get an extra pawn, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there's also renewable powers. And these are powers that you pay for using your cards and then you use them one time. And if you want them back, you have to pay for them again. So let's talk about permanent powers first. And we'll also do that in conjunction with the cards. So basically there are a few different card types from the community deck. So you can have family, you can have farm animals. This is a resist card because it has this fist in the top left corner. By the way, this art is by Lamaro Smith, who I've interviewed for my podcast and who I like speaking with quite a bit. I like his art a lot. Um, so in my opening hand for this player, I have got two family cards, three farm animals, and a couple of resist cards. These can be used to either resist your landlords, um, which will be handy, or they can be played for special actions. So you have to kind of decide how you want to use them. So basically here I have guarding cards on the actions per turn section. Uh, if I discard two guarding cards, because it says guarding here, then I can get three actions per turn instead of my base two. If I can discard three of those cards after that, then I can get four. So you have to go in order. No, just discarding three and going straight to four. But basically if I'm collecting guarding cards, I can discard them to upgrade my actions per turn. Similarly, I can get more movement by discarding farm animal cards. I can do two, three, then four to get to move four, five, and six, which is pretty great. If I discard family cards, I can get pawns, additional pawns in the game. And then I can donate more cards per turn if I discard church cards. So, so two and then three, basically these will let me contribute to my community more quickly, which can be very handy if you want to meet a community goal. And then if I discard some blues cards, just two of them, I can cross the water, which is also a pretty key ability to have. Over here on the left are renewable powers. So for example, a farm animal and a family will let you build a levy for cheaper one time. Um, if you have your garden and the church that lets you move twice, blues plus church will let you resist one time without spending a card. It's just, you can do it as a power. Um, having food, family, and blues will let you upgrade one power. So if you are having a hard time collecting specific sets of cards, you can do three different ones, get that renewable power and pay. And then if you have the ability to cross the water, you give up a farm animal and one of these job offer cards that lets you build a levy. So with the hammer in the corner, um, then you can build a raft and a raft lets you move up and down the river more quickly, rescue survivors and more. Here at the bottom, um, each of these cards also has an individual victory point goal. I'm not planning to do that for this particular playthrough, but if you want to, you can actually assign individual victory points, scoring opportunities to the players so that you can win together by surviving. And then the person with the most victory points is the one who win wins because they had the most victory points. So as mentioned previously, the first phase of the turn is to upgrade player abilities. So now let's look at our cards and see if we want to upgrade anything. So I've got a couple family cards and I might just go ahead and discard them for my last pawn, but I think I might hold on to them actually. What about farm animals? So they can give me more movement per turn. I want that bad. So I'm gonna get rid of these two farm animals and hold on to my other cards. 
in order to have better movement per turn. So that's definitely what I'd like to do as the blue player. So these will go into discard. You'll notice I put the community deck in a, like, a different spot because I wanted my player mass down here. You'll be able to do as you wish with your own copy one day. Um, and then here I've got, and then here I've got um, the orange player's hand. Education is basically wild because education is wild, everyone. I particularly love the art on this card because I knew what it was before I actually read the text. Um, Lamar Smith, the artist, told me that his mother was a teacher. And so this is one of his favorite cards to make because he feels like it represents his mom. I thought it was awesome. So here we've got a couple family. We've got some resist. We've got this church power. Huh. I think what I might do actually is go ahead and spend some of these cards to get a renewable power for the orange player so we can see how that part works. So let's go ahead and give up the farm animal and the family card in order to put one of our cubes here and that'll make building a levy cheaper on a future turn. So I've done my first phase. I have upgraded my player abilities. And if you're playing multiplayer, of course, everybody does this at the same time with their own hand. I am a solo player, so I'll play it like that. <laughs> And then I need to replenish and resolve landowner cards. So this is tough because basically I've got three of these showing. You have to draw three to start with, but then you have to take actions to draw more. So if you end up with a bunch of stuff that's not job offers, you have to decide after you resolve if you're going to risk taking more stuff off that deck um, because you really need to work or can you let it go for a turn. On my initial landowner card reveal, um, I got landowners issue a threat. And the active player, who's blue, because that's currently the first player, um, takes a card, takes this card into their hand, and I can counter it by discarding one resist card. So basically, this card is trying to clog up my hand with crappy cards that I don't want, that don't do anything, and I don't want that. So I can get rid of it by discarding a resist card. So I think I'm going to go ahead and do that this time and just not even worry about it. So one of my resists is Vaudeville Fundraising. It's really nice because I can use it to draw cards for everybody but I am instead going to ditch it in order to get rid of this Landers Issue Threat card. So this will go in the discard. So I have dealt with that threat. That means that the Landers cards have been drawn and resolved. So we're cool for now. Then our next phase is going to be player actions, which we're gonna complete by turn. So let me walk you through the player actions. So my options for actions on a turn, and right now I can know that I can take two actions per turn because that's where my cube is. If I get some guarding cards later, I can do more actions, which sounds pretty killer good to me. So, but basically the actions that we can take, you could take two, you could take the same one twice, are move, donate, work, and resist. Move basically just means taking your pawn and you're moving it around the board. Um, even though the hexes are grouped for flooding purposes, you move one hex at a time for your movement. So right now I have got four movement per turn because I discarded those farm animals. So I can move one of my pawns up to four spaces, which seems pretty great to me. I can donate. And basically what that means is that I can give cards to another player. So if somebody really needs a resist card or somebody really, you know, needs to make a set and they really need a garden card or a church card or whatever, you can use that part of your turn to give that to them. You can also donate to the community. So this is also the way that you are giving to community goals if you're playing the game with those. You can work. Basically what that means is that you accept a job offer from the landowner. So basically on your turn, you accept a job offer, you take that card and you can play it to either build a new levy. So if you grab two, then you can discard it to build a new levy. Or if you do one, then you can discard it to raise existing levy height by one. So basically when you work, what you're doing is you're building. So moving and working is a major part of the game. You're gonna to wanna to move to the more vulnerable spots and work to shore them up. And then the other thing that you can do is resist. So if you remember those cards that had, so if you remember those cards that had a fist on them, those are resist cards and they have a special action. That counts as one of your actions per turn if you play your card for the resist action. And right now I can do two of any of those things in any combination per turn, uh, but hopefully I'll be able to do more down the line as I draw more community cards. So let's go ahead and take my blue player actions. We'll take the orange ones and then we'll just kind of continue working through the turn. All right, so as the blue player, I can't cross water yet and there's nothing that's at a two. I'm not sure that I want to necessarily um, mess with levies at this point because I think the orange player is better positioned to do that. So I think what I might actually do 
is we're going to try to play a resist. So we're going to play the newspaper, which lets me discard the newspaper card to reveal the next three weather reports so I can get a sense of where I would want to build. So we know that I'm going to get medium rain in Mounds Landing. Ugh, so that's going to go up a little bit. Heavy rain in the Tinsaw Basin. That's not good. And medium rain in Yazoo Valley. I mean, at least it's in all different places, but it's going to be a little bit tough on that next turn. So I can't do anything about it, but I know that it's coming. So basically we can think about where I want to try to build a levee. Unfortunately, there's only so far that I can move, but we know that Mounds Landing is in a bit of trouble. We know that the Tinsaw Basin is in big trouble and that's down here. And we know that the Yazoo Valley, which is just all the lakes, um, we're going to have to go down through all of our lakes and look for any issues. So now that we know that, that was one of my actions. And so I just took a resist action. So knowing that, I kind of want to move maybe around these lakes um, because I'm a little bit concerned about them. So I think I want to take one of my pawns and do one, two, three, four movement. And I'm kind of heading this way. If I had a raft or something, that would be better. But I've got what I've got. So that was the entire turn for the blue player. I got to take two actions. Now the orange player is going to go. So orange, I think, will... Too bad I don't have a raft. Again, that would be great because I'd really like to get down here to the Tensaw Basin. I don't have anybody down here. So during setup, you basically place your towns in a place of your choosing within a certain distance of the water. And I didn't make the best choice. I, I wanted to pick a four, so I'd, I was up somewhere high, but I probably should have spaced my people out a little bit more and put my orange town down here. And so strategically, as you play the game, you're going to set it up differently every time and you'll learn some hard lessons as you go. That said, I think I want to come down this way so I can start helping out. And again, it'd be nice if I could cross the river because there's vulnerable stuff over here that I'm not taking care of and that I can't take care of. Uh, but I'm going to do one, two, three. And then let's do one, two, three. So I'm here to kind of start dealing with some of this, um, but I am at an elevation where I'm not going to get just completely destroyed. So those were actually, that was actually my entire turn uh, because I was moving and I was trying to get myself set up well for another turn. So basically everybody did their two actions. Player actions have ended. And now, unfortunately, it's time for that nasty, nasty weather report. So we're going to get medium rain in Mounds Landing. So let's go ahead and think about the water. So basically what happens is that um, once you've placed a blue water level token in a hex grouping with the dot for the area, um, then you're going to keep going in the next open river hex that's south of where you placed it before. So I know that I'm going to get two extra rain to this area underneath Mounds Landing this time. So this is a different river hex group from this one. And so I'm gonna place a token here. So basically what that's gonna mean is we're gonna go from one to three. And then we're gonna do that clockwise check to see if anything floods. The good news for me right now is that I don't think that it does. This is four. Basically if you start north and you go around, everything makes it because this hex group is not touching this little two on the land. So everything is okay for now, but it doesn't look great for the future, yikes. So let's draw our next weather report. All right, so now we've got heavy rain in the Tensaw Basin. So that's going to be add three. So now my water level down here in this next hex group down is going to be four. This is bad because if you look due north to what's touching, um, well, this entire hex group, even though I built levees here, is going to flood because one plus three is four. So these levees get lost. And then I have to put in flood tiles in this entire hex group. And because this hex group has flooded, it's going to force me to take another loss. And remember, I get 20 in seven weeks uh, before I lose. And this can accelerate really, really quickly. So the heavy rain happened. So basically what happens after that is that once you've done that heavy rain action, um, you lower the number here to three. And then you check again. So we're actually going to flood again. We're going to, we have a three here. So we're going to go clockwise again. We have one, two, and these are okay. But then this is level two. So we just lost another hex group. So 
So this flooded. And we're going to take another loss. Yikes. So basically, I just got smacked by this flood. Then we are going to draw one more. We have medium rain in Yazoo Valley. So basically, Yazoo Valley is all lake. So this lake already had a token. I think what that means is that this is the next lake. So we are going to assume again that it was level one. So we're going to put it at level three. And then we look around in a circle. And fortunately, none of the land that was touching that particular lake area was at a three. So we are okay for now, but it's going to get worse later. Oh, and I forgot to resolve over here. When this three flooded that two, this went down. So once things get flooded on land, the water levels go down a little bit, but that doesn't mean that you're going to be happy because it means that it flooded your land in order to go down. All right, so now that we've done the weather reports, that puts us in cleanup. So the first player marker is going to move. We add one to our week track. So we made it a week. It's a start. If any player has less than five cards, you draw your hands with the five. So I've got three cards here, so I'll get four, five. And then this player has five, so they don't draw back up. And then that is cleanup. So then we're going to go through the stages of the turn again. So maybe let's play just one more turn so you can see how it goes one more time. So once again, we can do the following. We can upgrade player powers. So let's see if I want to upgrade anything. So I think I'm going to actually hang on to my cards for now because I want to be able to resist things. And then over here, I think what I'm going to do is we are going to do family and farm animals in order to get a renewable player power because I would like that. So here's our hand, here's our discard, keeping it clean. All right, then we're going to replenish and resolve the land in our card. So there should always be three face up. So we're going to draw this. Oh, no. So we got a race hatred card. So basically, this is based on actual rules that came down from racist landlords in Mississippi from this time. So there's a quote on here from William Percy, head of relief efforts, who basically forces these sharecroppers to work. So all players have to pay one community card immediately. And then after the payment, you can discard this card. So I have to get rid of a community card. So I'm down to two cards. So I'll discard this one. And then here I'll discard church. Um, and then, so I've done my discard. This race hatred card will go away, but it costs me something. Then, then in phase three, we're again gonna do player actions, which we can complete by turn. So I wanna show you working this turn. Um, because I think that that's really important. Right now, the orange player is going to go first. So basically what I want to do is I want to build a levy here because I'm here and that's, I think, what the orange player would like to do. So what I can do, and this is why I wanted to show you this, basically what is going to happen is I can use my work action to take both of these landowner cards. And on the card, it says it can be discarded to build a new levy, or you can discard one to raise an existing levy by one. But I want to build a new levy. So what's going to happen is I have discarded these two cards. And that means I can take this three and make it a four. However, I'm going to have to take another action in order to replenish these cards for the blue player to use if they so chose. So the other action I'm going to do is seek work. And that's going to mean that I can draw three more landover cards, but that could be bad or it could be good. So this is working out okay so far. And yes, I got three job offers. So that's way better than getting something that forces me to discard more cards or otherwise have a mess on my hands. But we got lucky. You don't actually know what's going to come out of there. So those are the orange player's two actions, and now it's Blue's turn to go. If I want to work again, I could also work for the community um, and take community cards. So the work action is also a way so you can take landowner jobs or deal with them, or you can get cards. So if you're looking for something to complete a set, that may be what you choose to do. So I think that blue is a little bit worried maybe about these lakes up here. So I'm going to go one, two, three, four. And then I want to accept work for sure. So I'm going to take these two job offer cards. Actually, I'm going to take just one job offer card and I'm going to use my renewable power to decrease the cost of building that extra levy by one. So I can spend this job offer card and this renewable power to build a new levy here for three. So basically I'm just trying to do what I can up here in my lakes to make myself a little bit safer and prevent lake floods from destroying all my stuff. 
So those are all of the actions taken. So now we're going to reveal and resolve weather report cards. Yikes. So, okay, this time we got medium rain and cabin teal. So cabin teal is right here. Medium rain is two basically droplets of rain. So our level will go to three. And then let's do like a little check clockwise. We're doing okay. This is okay. So we have this little hex group, right? So this is all right. And then we're gonna come down to the next thing that this group touches and boom, we hit a two. So we're gonna lose some more land. We are going to have a loss. And then this is gonna go back down to two. So at least it calmed down a little bit, I guess. Ugh. And then two more weather cards to go. So this one, whoo, cloudy. Yes, no change. Okay, so that one, nothing happened. And then this one, oh, awesome. So it's cloudy again, but that also means that later when I really wish there was a cloudy, it won't be there. So, you know, it's six and one half a dozen the other. And then we'll do cleanup. So those are two full turns of the game. And hopefully this is going to give you an idea of this game is really tough. So this is the easy version of the game. <laughs> um, and also, you know, the kind of value of some of the things that have been added to the game. So I gave you the base version, but it might feel like, oh, I want to be able to do more stuff. That's where the, that's where the relief camps are going to come in. That's where the community goals are going to come in because you can reverse losses. And that's also where things like the raft and the survivors are going to come in because you're actually going to be able to go and help people. And that is scary because they can die um, but from flooding. But it's also really nice because you can save someone and it feels really good. The other thing I kind of want to note is that, you know, you're going to take a lot of losses in this game. A lot of stuff is going to flood and it is not easy. That's because the actual natural disaster wasn't easy and this game is meant to evoke history. So one of the reasons that you are paying attention to how many losses you can take and trying to reverse them through things like the community goal cards is that you're not meant to get through this game with no losses. You're meant to get through this game with as few losses as possible. And it's meant to teach you how much was inevitably lost by the people who were stuck in this situation in 1926 or 1927. So this is a glimpse into Rising Waters. It is a peer-reviewed, historically certified game from Central Michigan University Press. Its designer is Professor Scout Blum. And if you play it, you will get a simulation of what it was like to try to cope with excessive flooding during a natural disaster with no one to help you but yourselves. So hopefully this playthrough gives you a sense of why this game is for you. Thank you so much for watching. The Kickstarter page will be linked below in the show notes. Please do like, comment, subscribe, ask questions, and most of all, happy gaming.